A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Second, The Golden Thread. Chapter Four, Congratulatory. From the dimly lighted passages of the court, the last sediment of the human stew that had been boiling there all day was straining off when dr manette lucy manette his daughter mr lorry the solicitor for the defence and its counsel mr stryver stood gathered round mr charles darnay just released congratulating him on his escape from death it would have been difficult by a far brighter light to recognize in dr manette intellectual of face and upright of bearing the shoemaker of the garret in paris yet no one could have looked at him twice without looking again even though the opportunity of observation had not extended to the mournful cadence of his low grave voice and to the abstraction that clouded him fitfully without any apparent reason while one external cause and that a reference to his long lingering agony would always as on the trial evoke this condition from the depths of his soul it was also in its nature to arise of itself and to draw a gloom over him as incomprehensible to those unacquainted with his story as if they had seen the shadow of the actual bastille thrown upon him by a summer sun when the substance was three hundred miles away only his daughter had the power of charming this black brooding from his mind she was the golden thread that united him to a past beyond his misery and to a present beyond his misery and the sound of her voice the light of her face the touch of her hand had a strong beneficial influence with him almost always not absolutely always for she could recall some occasions on which her power had failed but they were few and slight and she believed them over mr darnay had kissed her hand fervently and gratefully and had turned to mr stryver whom he warmly thanked mr stryver a man of little more than thirty but looking twenty years older than he was stout loud red bluff and free from any drawback of delicacy had a pushing way of shouldering himself morally and physically into companies and conversations that argued well for his shouldering his way up in life he still had his wig and gown on and he said squaring himself at his late client to that degree that he squeezed the innocent mr lorry clean out of the group i am glad to have brought you off with honour mr darnay it was an infamous prosecution grossly infamous but not the less likely to succeed on that account you have laid me under an obligation to you for life in two senses said his late client taking his hand i have done my best for you mr darnay and my best is as good as another man's i believe it clearly being incumbent on some one to say much better mr lorry said it perhaps not quite disinterestedly but with the interested object of squeezing himself back again you think so said mr stryver well you have been present all day and you ought to know you are a man of business too and as such quoth mr lorry whom the counsel learned in the law had now shouldered back into the group just as he had previously shouldered him out of it as such i will appeal to dr manette to break up this conference and order us all to our homes miss lucy looks ill mr darnay has had a terrible day we are worn out speak for yourself mr lorry said stryver i have a night's work to do yet speak for yourself i speak for myself answered mr lorry and for mr darnay and for miss lucy and miss lucy do you not think i may speak for us all he asked her the question pointedly and with a glance at her father his face had become frozen as it were in a very curious look at darnay an intent look deepening into a frown of dislike and distrust not even unmixed with fear with this strange expression on him his thoughts had wandered away my father said lucy softly laying her hand on his he slowly shook the shadow off and turned to her shall we go home my father with a long breath he answered yes 
the friends of the acquitted prisoner had dispersed under the impression which he himself had originated that he would not be released that night the lights were nearly all extinguished in the passages the iron gates were being closed with a jar and a rattle and the dismal place was deserted until to-morrow morning's interest of gallows pillory whipping post and branding iron should repeople it Walking between her father and Mr. Darnay, Lucy Manette passed into the open air. A hackney coach was called, and the father and daughter departed in it. Mr. Stryver had left them in the passages to shoulder his way back to the robing room. Another person, who had not joined the group, or interchanged a word with any of them, but who had been leaning against the wall where its shadow was darkest, had silently strolled out after the rest, and had looked on until the coach drove away. He now stepped up to where Mr. Lorry and Mr. Darnay stood upon the pavement. "'So, Mr. Lorry, men of business may speak to Mr. Darnay now?' nobody had made any acknowledgment of mr carton's part in the day's proceedings nobody had known of it he was unrobed and was none the better for it in appearance if you knew what a conflict goes on in the business mind when the business mind is divided between good-natured impulse and business appearances you would be amused mr darnay mr lorry reddened and said warmly you have mentioned that before sir we men of business who serve a house are not our own masters we have to think of the house more than ourselves i know i know rejoined mr carton carelessly don't be nettled mr lorry you are as good as another i have no doubt better i dare say and indeed sir pursued mr lorry not minding him i really don't know what you have to do with the matter if you'll excuse me as very much your elder for saying so i really don't know that it is your business business bless you i have no business said mr carton it is a pity you have not sir i think so too if you had pursued mr lorry perhaps you would attend to it lord love you no i shouldn't said mr carton "'Well, sir,' cried Mr. Lorry, thoroughly heated by his indifference, "'business is a very good thing, and a very respectable thing. "'And, sir, if business imposes its restraints and its silences and impediments, "'Mr. Darnay, as a young gentleman of generosity, "'knows how to make allowance for that circumstance. "'Mr. Darnay, good night. God bless you, sir. "'I hope you have been this day preserved for a prosperous and happy life. "'Chair there!' Perhaps a little angry with himself, as well as with the barrister, Mr. Lorry bustled into the chair, and was carried off to Tellson's. Carton, who smelt of port wine, and did not appear to be quite sober, laughed then, and turned to Darnay. "'This is a strange chance that throws you and me together. This must be a strange night to you, standing alone here with your counterpart on these street stones.' "'I hardly seem yet,' returned Charles Darnay, "'to belong to this world again. "'I don't wonder at it. "'It's not so long since you were pretty far advanced "'on your way to another. "'You speak faintly. "'I begin to think I am faint. "'Then why the devil don't you dine? "'I dined myself while those numbskulls were deliberating "'which world you should belong to, this or some other. "'Let me show you the nearest tavern to dine well at.' drawing his arm through his own he took him down ludgate hill to fleet street and so up a covered way into a tavern here they were shown into a little room where charles darnay was soon recruiting his strength with a good plain dinner and good wine while carton sat opposite to him at the same table with his separate bottle of port before him and his fully half insolent manner upon him do you feel yet that you belong to this terrestrial scheme again mr darnay i am frightfully confused regarding time and place but i am so far mended as to feel that it must be an immense satisfaction he said it bitterly and filled up his glass again which was a large one as to me the greatest desire i have is to forget that i belong to it it has no good in it for me, except wine like this, nor I for it. So we are not much alike in that particular. Indeed, I begin to think we are not much alike in any particular, you and I. 
Confused by the emotion of the day, and feeling his being there with this double of coarse deportment to be like a dream, Charles Darnay was at a loss how to answer. Finally, answered not at all. "'Now your dinner is done,' Carton presently said. "'Why don't you call a health, Mr. Darnay? Why don't you give your toast?' "'What health? What toast?' "'Why, it's on the tip of your tongue. It ought to be. It must be. I swear it's there.' "'Miss Manette, then. Miss Manette, then.' Looking his companion full in the face while he drank the toast, Carton flung his glass over his shoulder against the wall, where it shivered to pieces, then rang the bell and ordered in another. "'That's a fair young lady to hand to a coach in the dark, Mr. Darnay,' he said, ruing his new goblet. A slight frown and a laconic, "'Yes,' were the answer. "'That's a fair young lady to be pitied by and wept for by. "'How does it feel? "'Is it worth being tried for one's life "'to be the object of such sympathy and compassion, Mr. Darnay?' "'Again Darnay answered not a word. "'She was mightily pleased to have your message when I gave it her. "'Not that she showed she was pleased, but I suppose she was.' The illusion served as a timely reminder to Darnay that this disagreeable companion had, of his own free will, assisted him in the strait of the day. He turned the dialogue to that point and thanked him for it. "'I neither want any thanks nor merit any,' was the careless rejoinder. "'It was nothing to do in the first place, and I don't know why I did it. In the second, "'Mr. Darnay, let me ask you a question.' "'Willingly.' and a small return for your good offices. Do you think I particularly like you? Really, Mr. Carton, returned the other, oddly disconcerted, I have not asked myself the question, but ask yourself the question now. You have acted as if you do, but I don't think you do. I don't think I do, said Carton. I begin to have a very good opinion of your understanding." Nevertheless, pursued Darnay, rising to ring the bell, there is nothing in that, I hope, to prevent my calling the reckoning, and our parting without ill blood on either side. Carton rejoining, nothing in life, Darnay rang. Do you call the whole reckoning, said Carton, on his answering in the affirmative. Then bring me another pint of this same wine drawer, and come and wake me at ten. The bill being paid, Charles Darnay rose, and wished him good night. Without returning the wish, Carton rose too, with something of a threat of defiance in his manner, and said, "'A last word, Mr. Darnay. You think I am drunk?' "'I think you have been drinking, Mr. Carton.' "'Think you know I have been drinking. Since I must say so, I know it. Then you shall likewise know why.' I am a disappointed drudge, sir. I care for no man on earth, and no man on earth cares for me. Much to be regretted. You might have used your talents better. Maybe so, Mr. Darnay, maybe not. Don't let your sober face elate you, however. You don't know what it may come to. Good night. When he was left alone, the strange being took up a candle, went to a glass that hung against the wall, and surveyed himself minutely in it. "'Do you particularly like the man?' he muttered at his own image. "'Why should you particularly like a man who resembles you? There is nothing in you to like, you know that. Ah, confound you! What a change you have made in yourself! A good reason for taking to a man that he shows you what you have fallen away from, and what you might have been, changed places with him, and would you have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was, and commiserated by that agitated face as he was?' "'Come on, and have it out in plain words. You hate the fellow!' He resorted to his pint of wine for consolation, drank it all in a few minutes, and fell asleep on his arms, with his hair straggling over the table, and a long winding sheet in the candle dripping down upon him. End of Book 2, Chapter 4